Welcome and good morning. We're glad you're here at Calvary Bible Church today to worship. Everybody would like to come in and get seated and we'll get ready to get started. I have a couple announcements today. Um, don't forget we have our handouts in the back if you want to grab one before we get rolling. Uh, one is for the outline, the other has a, a map of the, of the cities we'll be talking about today. So grab your materials, they're in a little table in the back here. If you'd like to follow along that way. Also, if you haven't got your offering um, envelopes yet, we have them over here. Uh, if you don't get them every year and you would like one, let one of the deacons know and they'll sign you up for one. Also, we have a plan coming out for January 17th. January 17th, we'd like to have a, a congregational meeting. Uh, and afterwards, just bring a sack lunch or something. We can set up in here and eat a quick lunch. We'd like to talk, talk about the discipleship program and how it's going to roll out and perhaps get, start to get sign-ups even for it. But we're excited about it. We want you guys to learn about it. So plan on about at least an hour meeting. So we'll bring our own lunches and stay afterwards and learn about that. Otherwise, let's get our worship service started. Good morning. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to start by singing hymn number 143, please. Infant holy, infant lowly. Let's sing both stanzas. Infant holy, infant lowly. Oh, 
be seated. At this time, Grace Boss is going to come and recite some of the Bible for us of the Christmas story. Luke 2, 8 through 20. And there were shepherds out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks by night. The angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that shall be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you, and he is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great multitude of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, worshiping God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth, peace on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary, Joseph, and the baby who was lying in a manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning all that they had been told about this child, and all who heard were amazed at what shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which was just as they had been told. Luke 2, 8 through 20. Thank you. Well, isn't that wonderful to have a fine mind like that to put all those scripture verses in? That's wonderful. And the story of Christmas as well. Well, let's take a few moments and pray together now as a church congregation. Our Heavenly Father, it is so nice to hear the story of the birth of Jesus. We are so thankful this Christmas season that we can see your divine plan in hindsight. It helps us to understand that we are the benefactors of your grace. We desire to be like the shepherds, that's to give glory and praise unto your name. We desire to be like the wise men, to give our all to worship you. We are truly a people who owe you everything. Please accept our praise this morning from our hearts. Come and be present in our praise and hear our prayers. Send your Holy Spirit to convict us deep within our consciences of our sin. Illumine our minds to the truths of Holy Scripture so we can discern your will. We ask, Lord, as we prepare for the new year coming, that our hearts and minds might have clarity as to what your will is for us, both our lives individually and for us as a church corporately. Help us to live holy lives, set apart, and lives that will be pleasing unto you. Help us to continue to grow in our moral development as we read Scripture so that we can conquer sin. Allow us to understand how much you hate sin that sin which we love so much. And may we learn to hate it also. Further, may we learn to repent from it, and to turn from our sin, and to follow you and your ways instead. Help us as a church to be united, learning how to live with one another, and even how to work together to rep- represent you through the work of the local church. For we know that we'll become stronger, a stronger witness as we learn to be a body that works together. I also want to pray for the needs of our local church. Be close to our people uh, this Christmas season. There's so many things out there. Some have physical issues. Some are grieving. Some are lonely. Some have financial issues. There's all kinds of things that are out there. Lord, I just pray that you be close to our people and help them work through the trials of life. And as they see your hand working, may it grow them and deeper and deeper in their faith. And finally, Lord, we come back to our true desire this morning, and that's the same as the psalmist when he wrote some 3,000 years ago. 
Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. Give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory do his name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of his holiness. Oh, we want to do that, Lord. We want to come before your throne with joy as our hearts are full of worship this morning. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Grace, thank you for coming up and reciting or not reciting, but <laughs> shaking that from memory. Grace's been doing that since she was like, what, five? Re reciting stuff like that? It's, she's been amazing. I didn't know if she was big enough to stand over the podium, but she definitely is. Thank you for that. Would you stand with me again, please? A couple more songs before Pastor Coggin comes. We're going to sing, uh, We Praise the O God, Our Redeemer. Hymn number 16, if you have a hymn book. Let's sing stanzas 1 and 3, please. We praise the O God, our Redeemer, Well, good morning, everyone. I invite you to take your Bibles, please, and turn with me to Revelation chapter 2. As we continue our look at Christ's letters to the seven churches in Revelation. And we've been looking at these with a very specific goal in mind. We've been looking at these and searching for guidance in how we, as followers of Christ, are to live life together. We spent most, uh, some of October and November thinking deeply about what it means individually to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And indeed, uh, we come to Christ in a way that affects us personally. But we then see very quickly that being a Christian is about being together with other Christians. We live life together. We are the body of Christ. We've seen in Ephesians chapter 4 and we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and that every one of us is important to that body. Each one of us plays a critical role in bringing glory to God. Each one of us as a follower of Jesus Christ has been gifted by the Holy Spirit and it's together, it's together 
that we advance the cause of Christ and grow spiritually. And so as we've been studying these letters, these churches, we've been asking ourselves two important questions. How were these churches living life together well? What were they doing to bring glory to God's name? And how were they advancing the cause of Christ? And I hope that you picked up some sermon notes on the way in, but by way of a bit of review, and I won't call for shout-outs of answers, although that would be okay if I did. Do you remember what was good and positive about the church at Ephesus? What were they doing well? If I gave you a pop quiz today, what, do you recall what Ephesus was doing well? Well, they were a hard-working church. The Bible tells us that they toiled for the cause of Christ. They were not spectators. Their faith was not lived while sitting in a pew. They worked hard. In fact, the word toil, if you remember correctly, refers to someone who works to the point that they are breaking a sweat. They are working hard. Then they are persevering in their faith. In other words, they were staying steadfast. And they tested teachers. Remember about... Ephesus, when someone came in and started teaching, they, they had good discernment. They knew how to listen to them carefully and make sure they were teaching what the apostles taught and what Christ himself taught. But they had a problem. They had a fatal flaw. Do you remember their fatal flaw? They had lost their first love. They had lost their first love. And so Jesus calls on them to remember. He says, remember and repent and return to that first love. Why? Because motives matter. And he was telling them in no uncertain terms, if you're not doing this because you love me, then you are wasting your time. And he said if they did not return to their first love, he was going to do what? Take away their lampstand. Remove uh, their church from having any influence in the city of Ephesus. And then we turn to Smyrna, the next city in Asia Minor on the Roman post road. As you head a little north out of Smyrna, you come, excuse me, out of Ephesus, you come into Smyrna, and we saw that this was the church that was under persecution. This is the church that was suffering. And so they were holding fast even in, under the threat of death. And Christ told them and encouraged them. He said, do not be afraid. Do not fear. Don't fear what's happening to you. Don't fear what's about to happen to you. Uh, I am with you. And that church received no warnings. There was no rebuke from Jesus for that church. Only words of encouragement. Only words of edification. And then last week it was Pergamum. And what was good about the church at Pergamum? Well, you may recall they were holding fast their faith. They did not deny the name of Christ. In fact, some of them had been put to death for their faith. This was a steadfast church that was also under persecution. However, Jesus had this against them. What were they doing wrong? What was their weakness? They were allowing false teachers to come in, and they weren't rebuking them and removing them. And so Jesus tells them to repent of that and to Send out the false teachers. And so now we add to this list the church at Thyatira. And this is a pretty long letter. So let's just listen carefully from Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. Listen carefully to the words to the church at Thyatira, because Jesus has quite a bit to say to them. Verse 18, and to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, the Son of God, who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says this, I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance, and that your deeds of late are greater than at first. But I have this against you that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality 
and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness, and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation, unless they repent of her deeds. And I will kill her children with pestilence. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. Nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. And he who overcomes and he who keeps my deeds until the end to him, I will give authority over the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my father. And I will give him the morning star. He who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. Well, before we dive into this letter and unpack it, it's probably worth just mentioning that the call to the church to be pure and righteous is clear throughout the New Testament. The Bible makes it clear that as followers of Jesus Christ, we've been liberated. But liberated from what? What is it Christ set us free from? The answer is a type of, not just a type, an actual slavery. A slavery to sin. Before we come to Christ, when our sin calls, we answered. And we were happy to enter. And we were happy to do whatever our sin asked us to do. And we would work hard at serving it. But in Christ... We've been freed. Sin is no longer our master. And so the call to be free from sin and to be pure and righteous is absolutely crystal clear in the Bible. That is Christ's will for his church. That we embrace what is good and noble and virtuous and holy and righteous. We're not haughty. We're not puffed up. In fact, Paul reminds us several times in his letters to remember what we once were. We're not haughty. We're not arrogant about it. We know that it's not because of anything we did that we can now embrace what is good. We know it's because of what Christ has done that we can now embrace what is good and what is holy. So we don't rule it over people and lord it over them in a haughty, judgmental, puffed-up way. In fact, it makes us more humble, doesn't it? It makes us very humble to remember what we once were. But know this. We are to lovingly and firmly and with an eye toward reconciliation to address sin. The people of Jesus Christ are not comfortable with unchecked sin. It is not the life of a Christian to remain in sin and to be comfortable with it. But unfortunately, the history of the church for the last 2,000 years has been that too often the church is very comfortable with sin. Very at ease with it. In fact, we enjoy making peace with it because then we avoid conflict with people. We avoid conflict with our culture. We avoid conflict with other groups. And so it's sometimes easier just to do what? Turn a blind eye. Look the other way. Sometimes in the name of being loving, although there's nothing loving about it. In fact, when uh, I entered the seminary Early on, Cindy's father, who was a pastor, uh, arranged for us to have a meeting with a church looking for a pastor. It's a small, mid-sized Baptist church uh, just south of Montgomery, Alabama, our home state. And I remember going down for the interview, and Cindy went with me, and we were sitting there with their search committee. And it was 
all ages, and there were some men, and there were some women on it, and we were asking questions. And they got to me, and they said, what questions do you have for us? And I said, I asked them what I thought was a pretty simple question. I said, how do you handle church discipline? In other words, Matthew chapter 18. That's what I was asking them. How do you handle that? Where if someone is in open, unrepentant sin, you go to them and ask them to repent. And if they do, you've won your brother. And it goes no further. But if they won't repent, what do you do? You take a second witness. And if they still won't repent, you go before the church. And then if they still won't repent, you treat them as a tax collector. So I was just asking them, how do you handle that? And they were confused by the question. They said, what do you mean? And I said, well, let's imagine for a moment that you had a man in your church who was engaged in open adultery and was not stopping. What would you do? How would you handle that? And you know, there was an old man on that committee. He looked me right in the eye and he said, we would do nothing said, that would be judgmental and hateful. We would do nothing. Which, of course, at that moment, uh, I knew that I was going to be a horrible fit for them as pastor. Because the church cannot be comfortable with sin in its midst. It can't. You can't and call yourself by the name of Christ. It's not that we're haughty and puffed up. It's not that we're arrogant and judgmental. It's that we know that Christians have been set free from slavery to sin. And so they have to embrace it. Yes, we sometimes fail. Paul talked about that, didn't he? He said, that which I want to do, I don't do. And the things that I don't want to do keep creeping into my life. We all relate to that, don't we? That doesn't change the goal, does it? It doesn't change the goal that we love what is righteous. And we don't want to be comfortable with sin in our midst. Well, the church at Thyatira has grown comfortable with sin. It has made peace with sin. And now Christ is coming to shake them up. So we're going to do what we've been doing with each one of these churches. First thing we're going to do is we're going to look at the context. Who wrote it? Who received the letter? What was the city or the church like? And then we're going to look at what they are doing well. And then we're going to look at what they need to repent from. So let's just look at the context. And number one, uh, who is the writer? Well, by now you all know the writer is Jesus Christ. In fact, as he's introduced here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 18, that's really repeating words from Revelation 1 uh, in, right in the middle of that chapter. But look how he refers to himself. He refers to himself three ways. Number one. First thing he refers to himself is as the Son of God. Do you know that's the only time this phrase appears in the book of Revelation, Son of God? Mostly throughout Revelation, do you know what Christ calls himself? The Son of Man. In fact, that's what he calls himself in chapter 1, verse 13. When John is receiving this vision, he says, in the middle of the lampstands, one like a son of man. And do you know who he copied that phrase from? Daniel. Daniel's the one who referred to the Messiah as the son of man. It's a title, that son of man is a title that indicates he's our sympathetic high priest. He's identifying with us, his humanity. He is one who's come as our representative to stand before a holy God and to make peace with God by being our representative and our sacrifice. So he's the son of man. It's a very uh, inviting term, but here he uses the son of God. This idea that he is speaking in all of his divine authority. He's coming to the church at Thyatira, not as their, you know, sympathetic high priest. He's coming to the church at Thyatira as the divine one. Now listen, right off the bat, that lets you know the tone of this letter is going to be tough. This is probably, if I were at the church at Thyatira and I saw this opening as the son of God, the one with eyes like a flame of fire, the one with burnished bronze for feet, I would know this is not going to be, this is not a good letter. We're about to get some really challenging, challenging rebukes. 
Because look at the next way he describes himself. Number one is he's the son of God. Number two, he has eyes like a flame of fire. There's that divine judgment. In fact, when his second coming occurs in Revelation 19, this is the way he's described. He comes with fire, uh, fiery eyes that pierce and see all things. It's that sort of verse 19 where he says, I know your deeds. That's right. I have eyes that pierce to your very soul. I know exactly what you're thinking. I know exactly what you're doing. I know exactly why you're doing what you're doing. So this is a divine rebuke coming. And then finally, these feet of burnished bronze refers to purity and holiness. In fact, in that day and age, burnished bronze, well-polished well-polished burnished bronze was probably better than most mirrors of the day. In fact, it probably was the best mirror of the day. So this is a purity. He said, I'm coming as the, I'm coming as the Son of God. I'm coming with all my divine authority. I'm coming with eyes that look right into your very soul, and I'm coming standing on feet of purity and holiness. Yeah, this is, a, this is an introduction designed to shock them a bit, shake them a little bit. In fact, there may have been a few who said, you know what, stop reading. (laughs) I don't know if we want to hear the rest because you know it's going to shake them up. Well, to whom is it written? Well, it's written to the angel. And you may recall, we've now made that crystal clear. That's referring to probably the chief elder of the church in Thyatira. We know absolutely nothing about the church at Thyatira. We don't know anything about its founding We don't know uh, any records of who were its first initial leaders. Uh, We only know a little bit about some of the people who may have eventually come back and helped this church a little bit. I'm going to read from Acts 16, verse 14 and 15, a reference to Lydia. And so Acts chapter 16, verse 14 and 15 says this, And a certain woman named Lydia from a city of Thyatira, a seller of purple, fabrics, a worshiper of God was listening, and the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And then she and her household had been baptized, excuse me, and when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So some have speculated that after she became a believer, it's possible Lydia may have returned to her hometown and helped found the church there. The more likely scenario is simply that when Paul was in Ephesus for three years and was helping to found and preach to churches all over Asia Minor, that's when this church was found. That's when this church was planted during that time period. So that's what little we know about the church. What about the city? Well, this week I did provide, it was bothering me so much that you may not have had a map So I put little maps on the back so you can at least see how these cities are laid out. And if you can find Ephesus right on the west coast, and I apologize to you at home. Uh, Maybe I can send this out as an attachment later in the week so you can print it. But if you find Ephesus right on the west coast there of what is today Turkey, the modern country Turkey, it was Asia Minor then. And you go north, you find Smyrna. If you go further north, you find Pergamum. And then if you turn south, southeast, You've come to the city of Thyatira, and it's really a city that sits right at the northern end of a valley that runs from Thyatira south, southeast down to Laodicea. And you can't tell from this map, but if you were to draw on this map, there are mountain ranges between the line of cities of Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum, and the cities of Thyatira, Philadelphia, and and Sardis, and Laodicea. And so really, that's why the post road went north up the coast to Pergamum. And then the Roman post road turned south, southeast, down toward Laodicea to avoid those mountains. And so you can see the way these cities are laid out. And so there's a valley that runs north-south from Thyatira to Laodicea. And so Thyatira lays at the top of that valley. And it has several problems. Number one problem it has is that it's on a flat plain. There's no Acropolis in the sea. It's not like Pergamum. It was, that had a high 1,000-foot Acropolis to sit on, which means that there was no natural fortifications for the city. Very difficult for any troops garrisoned at Thyatira to hold out very long. 
In fact, when the Romans left troops there and before them, Alexander the Great and others, when they left troops there, you know what their goal was? Was just to slow down the invasion from the southeast to give Pergamum time to set up its defenses. What a great mission. You know, you're sent there basically just to be uh, fodder to slow down the invasion. And so Thyatira has a history of destruction and occupation. And it's never occupied very long because it's impossible to defend. And so it just goes from destruction, invasion, destruction, rebuilt, invasion, destruction, rebuilt. And so the first thing you probably should know about this city is it was impossible to defend militarily. It's on a flat plain. It was easy. It was an easy target. Until the Romans take over Asia Minor in 190 BC, and that brought the peace of Rome. And that allows Thyatira to become a wonderful center of commerce. It's really, if you look on this map, it's in a great position for commerce. It's on this north-south road running from Thyatira to Laodicea. It's close to Pergamum, the uh, capital of the, uh, of the province. It's not far from the road leading down to Smyrna and Ephesus. It's just in a great position to be a pretty good city of commerce. And that's what it becomes. And so the second thing I want you to note about it is that it really becomes such a center of commerce that labor unions take over the city. In fact, they had all manner of labor unions. There was unions for wool. There were unions for dyeing wool. Remember Lydia? She worked with purple wools and purple fabrics. So she's carrying on that tradition from Thyatira of dyeing these wools. And purple was their specialty in Thyatira because apparently there was a type of root that you could crush and make purple dyes. And you could find this root readily in Thyatira. So Thyatira is known for its purple dyes known for its purple fabrics. In addition to this, it has linen worker unions. It has outer garment leather, tanners, potter unions, bakers unions, slave trader unions, bronze makers unions. It's just a heavy trade city by the time this letter is written. So the first thing is it's not easy to defend military. The second thing is that once the peace of Rome came, and it didn't matter if you were an easy target militarily because nobody's invading, they thrive as a commercial center, and so labor unions take over and run the city. Third thing and final thing is that there's not, it's not a religious center. There's no big idol worship here. Apollo was their main god, but they were lukewarm about that. There was no Jewish population in Thyatira. So the problem that Smyrna had with the synagogue of Satan and the problem that Pergamum had with all the idol worship, these Christians don't really have that problem. Here's the problem they have. All the labor unions adopted their own deity. And if you were going to be in that labor union and have a job, you had to go to the big feast once a year. And they would worship to the idol, they would sacrifice to the idol, and then they would eat the food that had been sacrificed to the idol, and they would engage in sexual immorality as part of that feast. So the challenge for the Christians in Thyatira is this. If you're going to keep your job, you had to be in a labor union. And if you were going to stay in the labor union, you had to go to at least the big annual feast and worship the idols and engage in these horrible immorality acts that took place at the feast. So there's going to be a lot of pressure to compromise to keep their job. So it's with that in mind, that context in mind, let's just look at Jesus' assessment of where this church is and how they are behaving. So look at verse 19. I'm going to read verse 19 for you again. Christ says, I know your deeds. So, of course, he knows what his church is doing. He doesn't need a briefing. It's his church. He knows exactly what's going on there. And he really commends four things they're doing. And so there are four deeds that they are doing very well. He says, I know your love. There's number one. So they don't have the problem Ephesus had of forgetting their first love. He said, I know your love. They have faith. That's their second deed. He said, I know your service. There's their third deed. And you persevere, which means they stand fast. They're steady. 
He says, I, I see the good things you're doing. I know your deeds that are good, the love, the faith, the service, the perseverance. And then he commends them one other way. The second way he commends them is that he says that your deeds today of late are greater than at first. Now, that word greater is referring to the number. This isn't a quality assessment. He said, I just know you're doing more good deeds. Your love, your faith, your service, your perseverance. So this is a, 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 this is a good thing. This encourages us the same, that we should be growing in love and faith and active service and perseverance, and that we should be doing our deeds. We want them to be greater than they were of late than they were in the past. And so these are, these are good things about the church at Thyatira. But Thyatira's got a problem. In fact, I'd say it's got four deadly problems. Just like forgetting your first love was a lethal, fatal flaw, this church has a fatal flaw that it must address. It's that serious. Let me read verse 20 through 23. And we're going to look at what are really four pretty serious problems surrounding this church. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and eat things sacrificed to idols. And I gave her time to repent, it says, and she does not want to repent of her immorality. Behold, I will cast her upon a bed of sickness and those who commit adultery with her into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And then finally, verse 23, and I will kill her children with pestilence and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. What is the fatal challenge for this church? Well, there are four that I want to highlight. Number one, they are allowing a woman to have authority over the church and teach. And while this may seem like a small matter, it's in direct violation of how God has organized things spiritually from a leadership standpoint. The Bible makes it clear. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 12, Paul says, I put no woman in authority over the church. Why is that? Because the federal spiritual headship rests in the male. You know, Eve sinned first. Some of you are very familiar with what happened in Genesis chapter 3. Eve sinned first. But you know, the Bible never talks about her sin being the curse on the human race. You know whose sin is always the source of the curse that is passed on from every father? Every father in this room, you passed it on to your children, and every one of us received it from our father. It was Adam's sin that had the devastating impact on the human race because he is the one that God put in spiritual authority. He is the one that God put in spiritual authority, in this case over his wife Eve, and in the case of the church in that federal headship position and in that headship position over the church. So it's Adam's sin that is the problem because he is the one who stands as our representative. So the first problem that this church has is that they are allowing a woman to have a position of authority over the men in the church. And who is she? Well, it's not likely that her actual name was Jezebel. So do you know who Jezebel was in the Old Testament? Uh, not, not, there's nothing good to say about Jezebel. Uh, there's just nothing positive to say about her. Uh, join me in 1 Kings. I just want to make sure you remember who Jezebel was and who she is and why being called Jezebel is not a good thing you ever want to be called. This is not a positive thing. First Kings chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. 
So you're going to see that she is the wife of Ahab, who, by the way, is labeled the worst king that Israel has ever had, morally. We're not saying he was just bad because he was inept. He's bad because he is evil. And listen, that's saying something that Ahab was the worst. There were 20 kings of Israel. There were 20 kings of Judah. You know, of those 40 kings, you know, the Bible says that only eight of them did what was right in the sight of the Lord. 32 of them did what was wrong in the sight of the Lord. And of the 32 who did what was wrong in the sight of the Lord, the Bible tells us Ahab is the worst. But what's the worst thing he ever did? What's his... What's the most awful thing he ever did? Well, let's find out. 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 30 and 31. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all who were before him. Well, that's never something you want written about you. This is not a good thing. Verse 31. And it came about as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. In other words, I want you to make sure you understand what the Bible is saying. It's saying, listen... As if all of his sins weren't bad enough. (laughs) There's one thing even worse. That he married Jezebel. The daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians. And went to serve Baal and worshipped him. Now she's, she's awful. She is awful. And she is terrible. And the fact that Jesus is referring to this uh, woman teacher as Jezebel. This one who calls herself a prophetess in, sec- in Revelation chapter 2, verse 20, is, is not a good thing. But the second thing that's bad, so the first thing is they're allowing a woman to have this position of authority. The second thing is the content of her teaching. Well, what is she teaching them to do? Well, I'm going back to verse 20 of Revelation 2. He says, who calls herself a prophetess and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray into What? into acts of immorality and idolatry. So not only are they allowing a woman to teach over men, but they are also, the content of her teaching is awful. So what is she teaching? What is this about? Well, here's the most likely thing she's teaching, because this was the popular false teaching of the day. It was a very popular, and it would serve the people at Thyatira very well, and I'm going to explain that in a moment. But she's probably teaching something called dualism. Trace this back to Plato and the ancient Greeks. And here's what dualism taught. It taught that our physical body and our spiritual body are separate. And they don't influence each other. So you can see why this would be so seductive for people who are trying to keep their jobs in these labor unions. Here's what she's probably telling them. She's saying, listen, in your spirit, we know you serve Christ. In your spirit, we know that you love God. So it doesn't matter what you do with your body. So once a year, take your body and go into the feast and and worship the idols and engage in the immorality with your body. But we know, we know where your heart is. We know that you love Christ. The two are completely separate. And they don't impact each other. Now listen, that's not what the Bible teaches, by the way. The Bible doesn't teach this any... But you can see how somebody trying to hang on to their job could say, perfect. That's perfect. This is the best of both worlds, isn't it? I can keep my job. I can keep the labor union happy. I can show up this feast once a year. And then the other 364 year, days of the year, I can serve Christ, and it's all good. We know that you love Christ. We know you're a true believer. We know your spirit's in the right place. So take your body once a year and do whatever you want. This is most likely what Jezebel is teaching. And you can see how it, within that church, this dualism could have a lot of really sympathetic ears. Going, yep, this works. Because now I can keep my job. So the first thing is that they're allowing a woman to have authority over men. The second thing is the content of her teaching is unbiblical. And the third thing is is that it's actually having an influence. 
Notice what Jesus says in verse 20. He says, my bondservants are actually being led astray. People, my bondservants are actually starting to buy into this. They're finding this to be good teaching. Now listen, the only thing worse than being led astray is to be the person leading them astray. It's bad enough if you are being led astray, but if you're the one who's leading them astray, let me read something to you from Matthew chapter 18. This is, these are the words of Christ talking about false teachers. He says, but whoever caused one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, and by the way, little ones is a reference to believers, these young, impressionable easily influenced believers. He says, whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to stumble, it is better for him, in other words, the teacher, the false teacher, that a heavy millstone be hung around his neck and they be drowned in the depths of the sea. Woe to the world because of its stumbling blocks. For it is inevitable that stumbling blocks come, but woe to that man through whom the stumbling blocks come. And if your hand or your foot causes you to stumble, cut it off and throw it from you. It's better for you to enter life crippled or lame than having two hands or feet, two feet to be cast into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to stumble, pluck it out and throw it from you. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into the fiery hell. See that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that their angels in heaven continually behold the face of my Father who is in heaven. This is not about self-mutilation. This is not about cutting off a hand or plucking out an eye. This is about taking sin and doing whatever you have to do to get it out of your life. Take whatever steps you have to take. And that's exactly what Christ is about to do. He's about to come and cut off the hand. That's causing them to sin. He's about to come and pluck out the eye that's causing them to sin. And if you want to know what happened to the Jezebel of the Old Testament, I'll give you the quick synopsis. You can find it in 2 Kings chapter 9 uh, later. But she is thrown from the top of a, a house. She hits the ground. The Bible records that her blood splattered on the nearby horses. And before they could bury her, dogs came and ate her flesh. There was nothing left to bury. Yeah, the, thing that's, the third thing that's really troublesome about this church is she's having an impact. And Christ is about to pluck her out. He's about to pluck her out. This is not a good thing for this Jezebel. There's a fourth thing here that isn't spoken, but it's ser- seriously implied. And I just want to mention this because I think this is a big problem for the church at Thyatira. But you know what's implied by all this? The fourth thing that's really troublesome The elders are doing nothing to oppose her. She's going unchecked. She's going unchallenged. So much so that Christ is having to sweep into his infant church himself to take care of this problem. Now, I would submit to you that the elders should be taking care of this problem. But they're not. And quite frankly... That is quite troubling. You know what? They're probably just going along to get along. They're probably thinking, you know what the elders are probably thinking? They're thinking, if I stand up and say this dualism is wrong, people are going to lose their jobs. They're going to leave the church because they'd rather keep their means of a living than follow what the Bible is telling them that could cost them their, their livelihood. And so the elders sit quietly. And they allowed the dualism to be taught. And now Christ steps in to take action. Well, what action is he going to take? What action will Christ take against them? Well, this is not going to be pretty. This is pretty, um, this is actually, I would suggest, pretty harsh. And uh, the first thing I want you to notice about the action Christ will take is an act of compassion. Look at verse 21. And I gave her time to repent. I don't want you to miss that. Listen, he's showing her compassion. He's giving her, and in some regards, the church at Thyatira, a chance to repent. But she, he says, does not want to repent of her immorality. So what's he going to do? So the first thing is he shows compassion. 
The second thing, it says he's going to throw her on a bed of sickness. Now, I don't know if your Bible has the word sickness in italics. Does some of you have a version where your Bible has sickness in italics or has maybe brackets around it? The reason for that is that uh, that word does not appear in what John wrote. John just said that Christ said that he was going to throw her upon a bed. It's probably an indication that he is going to kill her. It's probably an indication that this is going to be death. And the reason why that makes a lot of sense is because it does say later on in a few verses he's going to kill her followers. So it stands to reason he is coming and he is going to cast her upon a bed of sickness. And it will be not just be any bed of sickness, it will be a bed of sickness unto death. And those, so that's the, that's the second thing. He's, he's in, the first one is he shows compassion to her, and when she won't repent, then he comes and he's now going to execute judgment, and it, and it appears to be a death sentence. And the third thing, he's going to hold accountable those who are following her. And those who commit adultery with her are going to be thrown into great tribulation unless they repent of her deeds. And it could be a lethal kind of accountability. Verse 23, and I will kill her children, her spiritual children, with pestilence. Boy, we've gotten a good taste of what that's like in the last nine months, ten months. Pestilence can be pretty effective. And all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. So what's the third thing he's going to do? He's going to hold them accountable. It's going to be a lethal accountability if they do not repent. And it's a severe punishment that will bring glory to his name. Look what he says. He says, all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Look at that. I, I, all the churches will know. This is going to bring glory to his name. All the churches should sit up and take notice of this. Christ loves and demands doctrinal purity for his church. Listen, this is why the book of James says you should be slow to be a teacher. You should be slow to desire to teach because doctrinal purity is so important and behavioral purity is so important that if you're not leading correctly, the punishment on you will be harsh. This is really an act of love, isn't it? It's just a tremendous act of love. And what does... Christ, in this, this section, as he addresses this problem, he does give a word of comfort to those who are not following her. He says, I, end of verse 23, I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. That's a word of encouragement. He says, listen, if you're not following her, if you're not obeying this false teaching, you don't have anything to worry. I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. But then he does say two things to his true followers. He's, verse 24 and 25, he says, But I say to you, the rest who are in Thyatira, who do not hold this teaching, so these are the true believers, who have not known the deep things of Satan, as they call them, I place no other burden on you. So what's the first thing he says? I have no other burden but to resist this woman. Listen, apparently, listen, standing up to this false teaching... <laughs> is going to be burdened enough for the time being. <laughs> he says, I, I don't give you any other burden except deal with this. Deal with this. I think it's quite telling that he says to them, I don't have any other burden for you because I know that if you can take care of sin in your midst and not tolerate it, that is a huge burden to lift. And he's encouraging them by saying, I, I don't have anything else for you except that I just don't want you I don't, I don't have any other burden to place on you. And he says, hold fast. Hold fast the things that you have. Verse 25, nevertheless, what you have, hold fast until I come. So those who did not engage in the de deep things of Satan, no other burden, and hold fast what you have until I come. Those are the two encouragements. Yet, oh, the Jezebel and her followers thought they could play with the things of Satan and not get burned. They thought that they could dabble and tolerate with sin and no consequences would come. And that is wrong. And it is foolish. And it does not understand the nature of Christ and who he is. And it does not understand 
what they have been called to do. So they have no other burden except to oppose her, hold fast what they have, and then finally their reward. And here are the words of encouragement, verses 26 through 29. And he who overcomes, well, that's a description of all Christians, because the Christians are the people who overcome the world, overcome sin because of the strength of Christ. And he who keeps my deeds until the end, to him I will give authority over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of the potter are broken to pieces, as I also have received authority from my Father. What's the first reward? To rule with Christ. And we see that later in the book of Revelation when Christ returns and all of his followers are coming with him to rule and to reign. He said, I have given you an iron rod. Authority. Christ will rule and they are going to rule with him. The ones who have disobeyed are going to be crushed and the nations of the world who disobey are going to be crushed. But the followers, the faithful followers will rule. And then, of course, the second thing he gives to them is himself. Verse 28. And I will give him the morning star. Do you know who the morning star is? That's Christ. It's funny, the morning star. What we call the morning star, do you realize it's not actually a star, it's Venus. You get up early in the morning, you can see it as it's setting, it's bright, and it dominates the skyline, and you can't miss it. And it's always there, and it's steady. Its track is steady, the way planets' tracks are steady, and It's the morning star. You know what he's going to give them? Himself. So I've given you myself. What more can I give? And then finally, the church's reward is an ear to hear. This is quite beautiful. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Yes, I will give you the right to rule with me. Yes, I will give you myself. I give you the morning star. But finally, I give you an ear to hear, to know, and to act. Well, in conclusion, what happened to this church that tolerated sin? What was their final end? Well, I must report to you that it was not a happy ending. This church is only going to last about another hundred years before it collapses under the weight of another heresy. The Montanist... The Montanist who taught that God is continuing to teach through new revelation. In other words, the Montanists were teaching that the book of Revelation was not the end of God's revelation. That there was more being written. And the Montanists became very popular in Thyatira. And by the second century A.D., that church was no more. Christ had to close their doors because they were bringing more shame to his name than they were glory. What is the encouragement to us? Cling to truth. Reject error. Don't get comfortable with sin. Don't tolerate it. You can lovingly and firmly oppose it and know that this will bring honor to God and will bring his reward. So there's the challenge to us. It's no different for us, is it? Our culture is encouraging us to tolerate and go along to get along and compromise with sin every bit as much as the church at Thyatira faced. In fact, this message and the message to Pergamum may be two of the most poignant for the church in the United States. We cannot compromise with false teachers and we cannot compromise with sin. And our culture wants us to do both. And it's urging us that to do that all the time. Well, let's spend a few moments in prayer, praying for the fortitude and the perseverance not to compromise and not to give in. Let's pray together. Well, Lord, I thank you for the letters to the churches. And I thank you for granting us an ear to hear Help us to apply these great truths to our hearts and our lives collectively as a body where we are 
flirting with sin, where we are compromising with sin, where we are tolerating sin, Lord, bring it to our attention, both individually and as a body, together. Our prayer this morning is like the prayer of King David. Search me, O God. Know me. And if there be any wicked ways in me, bring it to my attention that I may repent and embrace righteousness. We pray that both collectively and individually this morning. Lord, we thank you for the warning you have given to the churches. We know that you are pure and holy. We know that you love what is right and what is virtuous. And we know that you have filled us with your Holy Spirit and empowered us to serve a new master, a master who is good and wholesome and noble. So, Lord, give us that kind of heart this morning and help us to serve you with all of our mind and all of our strength and all of our heart. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, Just a quick reminder of two things. Number one, you do not have to put up chairs this week because it's between Christmas and New Year's. We don't have any ministry things going on in the gym, but I will need you to do it next week. So next week we will need to put the chairs up. So I just, also, I don't know if you saw on the uh, uh, table there when you came in, but we need to update and make sure we have correct information in our directory. So if you want to be included in the directory, or if you want to be, uh, make sure uh, it, you know, if we need to update some information, we want, we're asking everybody to fill that out. Even if your information is the same, please fill that out in the next few weeks. And if you don't want your information in the directory, just check. There's a way to check and say, I don't want this in the directory. But we may need the information just so we know how to get in contact with you. So please take time to do that in the next few weeks. Thank you so much. sing together, breathe on me, breath of God. We're going to sing all four stanzas, please. Let me send you out with a closing benediction today from 1 Corinthians 16. It says, watch, stand fast in the faith, be brave, be strong. Let all that you do be done with love. Amen. You are dismissed.